Praise the Lord, young people of Australia. Welcome to our National Youth Ministries live stream tonight. And it's, I'm just so glad to have everyone online tonight for this time as we've been able to worship God and we're going to be able to share God's Word. I want to just welcome everyone that's joining us from around the world. I know that there's a number of uh, nations outside of Australia joining us tonight. So we just want to welcome you all. And we just know that God is going to do something great in our lives today. Amen. Praise God. Well, if we could turn in our Bibles, and hopefully you've got your Bible there, Jeremiah chapter 18, and we're going to start reading from verse 1. While you're turning there, I just want to thank Brother Greg Wilmont and the Youth Committee for this opportunity uh, to speak today, and also to our wonderful young people that led us in worship. I'm so proud of them. They did a wonderful job. Praise God. Jeremiah chapter 18 and verse 1. This is the prophet Jeremiah. It's a prophetic word to the people of Judah. It says, The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause thee to hear my words. Jeremiah says, Then I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought, he wrought a work, On the wheels. He wrought a work on the wheels. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again another vessel as seemed good to the potter to make. Then the word of the Lord came to me again, Jeremiah says. O house of Israel, cannot I do with you as this potter, saith the Lord. Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hands, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. This is a powerful portion of scripture that we've probably heard preached many, many times about the potter's hands. God says to Jeremiah, I want you to look at this potter. I want you to look at the clay. And he says, I want to do to you what the potter does to the clay. Won't you allow yourself to be in my hand? O house of Israel. Before I give you the title, I want to remind somebody tonight, whatever you are going through, God is still in control. Stay in the potter's hand. I want to minister tonight on this simple thought. I want to minister on this title, The Unseen Wheel. Let's just pray. Lord God, I just thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to gather. Lord, as youth from around Australia and around the world, Lord God, we need to hear from you, Lord God. So help me, oh God, to be the, the, your mouthpiece tonight, that people would not hear my voice or my words, or oh, but God, that they would hear you speaking to their hearts. So anoint my mouth and anoint my ears as I minister tonight. Help us to hear what you're going to say to the church tonight. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. And everybody say amen. The unseen will. One day, a very lonely frog went to a fortune teller. And I, of course, I wouldn't encourage anybody to go to a fortune teller. But this very lonely frog went to a fortune teller to see what his fortune would be. The fortune teller told the frog, he said, don't worry. Don't worry about your future, frog, because soon you're going to meet a girl This girl's going to want to know everything about you. And the frog's thinking, this is just what I wanted to hear. Finally, I'm going to meet a girl and she's going to be interested in me. The fortune teller said, you're going to meet a girl who's going to want to know everything about you. The frog was understandably so excited. So he asked the fortune teller, he said, when will I meet this girl? He said, oh, you're going to meet her next semester in the biology class. (laughs) Oh, he was about to get dissected. You see, sometimes, there's a, there's a point to that dad joke or that dad story. Sometimes things look good one minute, but then they can go south very fast. Sometimes things look good on the surface, but, but suddenly they just don't seem to be what they appear. And that's what it was like for that poor frog. It seemed like he was going to meet the girl of his j- dreams, but it was going to be in circumstances <laughs> Not so desirable. And so sometimes 
things can look good and then sometimes they can go south very quickly. Sometimes, and dare I say it, sometimes even to our own understanding, it can look like God doesn't know what he's doing. How? How our world, if you just think about what's happened over the last couple of months, how our world, our lives, our churches, our social lives, how it looked good one moment and like overnight everything has changed. Now we're having to do social distancing. Not so easy for some, for the introverts. I was talking to some, some introverts and some techs in our church, and I was telling them, I was saying, this is the day. This is your day. You have come into the kingdom for such a time as this. Because they're nerds and they're introverts. Never before has the church needed nerds more than they need them now. The technical people are the most important people in the church. Nerds and introverts, they're loving it, this social distancing. But for the extroverts, there's some of you out there tonight, being alone at home and not at youth tonight, it's killing you. How our world has changed. Things just seemed good one minute and then it all turned and went south. There are times when we can even feel like, in these times, and I want to speak to somebody that may be feeling this right now, that you not, don't just feel socially distanced, but because of the, the fact that you haven't been in fellowship and at church, you maybe even feel distant from God. There are times, let me tell you, I've been walking with God long enough to know that there are times when you will feel like that. It will feel like God is far from you. Sometimes we can't see Him. Sometimes we can't feel Him. But I've got a word for somebody today. Even when you can't track God, you can trust God. When you can't track His hand, you can trust His heart. Because God is still in control. And sometimes God can use distance in our feelings, to call us deeper into our faith. And I found that as a pastor in the first and second year, pastoring full time, and I would often sit in my office. Never before have I been surrounded by so many people in ministry, ministering to people's lives. But there were times I would sit in my office at the church, and I just felt so lonely. But I learned that that distance in my feelings, the fact that I was feeling lonely, it was God telling me, come on, it's time for us to have communion. It's time for us. To, it's time for you to come and pray. God is saying it's time for us to connect again. And I learned very quickly that sometimes God can use distance in our life to call us deeper in our faith. And I'm believing that when the church comes back after this time, that this time of distance is going to cause us to grow deeper in our faith faith and I'm expecting the greatest revival this nation has ever seen to begin to take place in our churches and so God told Jeremiah to go down to the potter's house he was saying Jeremiah just as the potter has the ability to to form a vessel he says Jeremiah I want to shape my people I want to mold my people I want to mold their destiny the potter's house the potter's house. I've read it so many times. I've heard it at youth camps. I've sung about it. I've heard it preached often. I've, I've preached it myself. But, but there was something in this account that I have missed all these years. I missed it until just recently when I was reading it. And, and you ought to read the scriptures with curiosity. Because this day I was not just glossing over a story that I've read a lot. I began to break it apart. I began to, to go into depth in it. And I, and I missed this. Jeremiah 18 verse 3 it says, Jeremiah went down to the potter's house and behold, the potter was working a work on the wheels. The wheels. Wheels is plural if you notice it right there. Now I'm going to say this, there is nothing in the Bible by accident. I have always pictured this in my mind as I read the scripture as a, a sort of soul trader. One man with a shop, uh, it was called the potter's house. So I imagine it was a, a home-based business, the potter's house. When I read it, it doesn't read like a factory. But it, but it says these words which I missed, but now I'm starting to get it. It says, he wrought a work on the wheels. Now what stood out was the plural, wheels. I thought to myself, maybe it just refers to all of the, the wheels that were in the shop, the, the different machines that he would use. But then I thought, hmm, maybe it's a mistake. 
Maybe it's meant to say, because I've always just thought the potter's wheel, but here I am reading about the wheels. So I looked at other versions. And, and yes, most of the other versions actually said, they said wheels, singular. But the King James Version says wheels, plural. I thought to myself, well, the King James must be wrong. So curious me, and I think they're about to throw a photo of this up, Curious me decided to look up a potter's wheel on the Bible days, back from the times of the Bible, to look at a picture. And what I found when I looked at that picture, it really began to open my eyes and I found out that, yes, the King James Version was right. Are you able to throw that picture up there of that, that potter's wheel, that ancient potter's wheel? If you can't, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to describe it to you. You see, what would happen in the, in the day, the potter had a wheel on the top. The top of the table was where the the pottery would be formed in the potter's hands. But underneath the table was an unseen wheel. Everybody focused on what was happening on the top of the table. Everybody focused on the potter's hands and the clay that is in his hands. They all focused on the, the wheel that is on the top. But there was an unseen wheel. If you look at the pictures for yourself, you can see it. There is an unseen wheel under the table. And the potter would use his foot to turn that wheel. He would turn the wheel under the table, making the um, the wheel on the top spin so that clay could be formed. There was more than one wheel. And yes, the potter was working a work on the wheels. And so, often when we look at a potter and we look at the piece of the clay, we can only see the things that are on the surface. But I've come to remind you today that there is a great truth in God's Word, that we can learn something from God's Word tonight, that there is an unseen wheel at work. It's not just what is happening on the surface, but there is something happening behind the scenes. It's the work of the unseen wheel. That wheel is there, the unseen wheel, motivating the work of the potter. Putting into motion the work that is on top of the table. Putting into motion the spinning of the clay on the top. It was worked by the potter's foot, but it was the unseen wheel. You see, in life, I've come to learn in, I'm not going to tell you how old I am, well, 40 plus I've come to learn that it's not always what you see happening on the top of the table that matters. But very often what is happening on the surface is dependent on the movement of the unseen wheel. And so tonight, young people of Australia, the lesson is clear. Our life is being shaped. Our life is being molded by the master potter, by the great potter, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He is molding our life. Yet we can only see what is happening on the surface. But everything that is happening on the surface is being motivated by what is happening under the table. It's the work of the unseen wheel. And you young people can see the circumstances in your life. You can see how things are playing out in your life on the surface. But I've come to remind somebody today that things are not always as they seem. There is a work that is going on behind the scenes. God has a purpose. God is still in control. We cannot just look at what is happening on the surface because we walk by faith and not by sight. And sometimes you've got to look at your circumstances and say, it doesn't make sense to me. I don't know what is happening. I don't know why this happened. But I want to tell you God is still in control it's the work of the unseen wheel the potter was working a work on the wheels God is in control he will make all things work together for good to them that love God and are called according to His purpose. He will make all things work together. It doesn't mean that all things are good. But when you bring them all together, they will all work together for good to them that love God 
and are called according to his purpose. I've come to speak to a young person tonight. You're looking at the surface circumstances that you're facing. You're looking at what you can see with your eyes. But I want to remind you that God is the master potter. He is molding you. You might not be able to see it on the surface, the circumstances you're going through. You might not be able to see God at work, but it's the work of the unseen will. Even when I can't see him, the song says he's moving. When I can't feel him, he's moving. It's the work of the unseen will. God is in control. He's molding me. He's making me. He's going to make me the masterpiece that he created me to be. It might not look like it on the surface right now, but it's the work of the unseen will. You see, the clay on the top of the table doesn't know anything about the wheel, the unseen wheel underneath. But if the unseen wheel wasn't there, nothing would be happening on the surface. In our text, we read about this unseen wheel, about the potter working a work on the wheels. But we also read something that is a little bit shocking if you care to read it carefully and care to really draw out what it is telling us. All of a sudden, and we know that God is likening himself in this portion of Scripture to being the potter. All of a sudden, the clay becomes marred. The clay becomes broken in the hands of the potter. The clay becomes messed up. The clay becomes wounded. The clay becomes bruised. Where? In the safest place. Where does the clay become broken? In the safest place. Where does the clay become marred? In the safest place. It became marred in the hands of the potter. It didn't fall off the shelf. It wasn't dropped by somebody. It was safely in the potter's hands when it became marred. It is where it needed to be. Yes. It was in the will of God. Yes. But it was still messed up. It was still marred. And I want to tell you that sometimes things may even be broken in our life. But God is attracted to our brokenness. Your brokenness doesn't stop the work of God. You can even be marred when you are in the will of God. And I know, and I wish I could pause long enough, but I, I, want, to give, I want to get through as quick as I can tonight. But I want to tell you this is a hard concept to swallow, to be marred in the will of God. But I want to remind somebody today under the sound of my voice, yes, the steps of a righteous man. But just think about this, the steps and the stops of a righteous man are ordered by God. You may not understand why certain things have happened in your life. You may feel like you don't deserve what has happened in your life. But whatever you do, I've come to tell somebody today, put your trust in the unseen will and stay in the hands of the potter. Stay in his hands. He won't leave you marred. He won't leave you bruised. He won't leave you broken. He will make you again into another vessel. Yes, the same clay. Yes, the same emotions. Yes, the same personality. Yes, the same brain. Yes, the same experiences. Yes, the same past. Yes, the same problems. But he will make another vessel from the same clay. Stay in the potter's hand. I've come to encourage somebody tonight. You feel like turning your back and walking away from God. You've given one God one last chance. Let me tell you, that's a foolish thing to do. Let me tell you, never walk away from God. Just stay in the hands of the potter and trust the work of the unseen will. John chapter 10, verse 28, Jesus says, And I will give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Listen, I want to tell you tonight, if you want to be in the potter's hand, nothing can take you out of his hand. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17 says, If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. I've come simply to encourage you tonight, stay in the potter's hand hand and trust the work of the unseen will don't just look at what's happening on the surface but understand that God is at work on the unseen will and tonight I'm going to show you just some little props I got here I got a I've got a jug here this is a one something that they make with pottery a jug some people call it a pitcher but you pour pour out okay 
Now, I was, was kind of cool. I pulled this out of the back of the cupboard and I found something. One of my favorite lollies was inside, a red skin. Maybe it's one of the young people want that tonight, hey? Just throw that over there. <laughs> so I got a jug, potters. And I've also got a bowl. Beautiful pottery bowl here. Probably didn't look like this back in the Bible days. It was probably that, that orange sort of pottery. But you can make a lot of vessels out of clay. And as I've been in pastoring for seven years and in youth ministry for a long time, one of the most popular questions when young people could get me alone and, and, and talk, they would often ask this. They would say, what is my purpose? I want to know what God has called me to do. What does God want me to do with my life? That is the, the greatest question that young people ask. They ask it all the time. And yes, you can make a lot of different vessels out of clay. God doesn't make us all the same. God has got a different purpose for every single one of us. You can make a bowl. You can make a jug. You can make a flower pot. But God will make you as he sees fit. And as he deems necessary, he will make you, he will put you in the body as he sees fit. Sometimes a bowl. We all love to be bowls. I love to be a bowl. Because you know what, what bowls are for? Bowls get put, things poured into them. And no, none of us don't like a blessing from God. No, none of us don't like being blessed and having prosperity and being poured into. And yes, sometimes God will make you a bowl and sometimes you're going to be receiving. You're going to be receiving blessings. You're going to, your life is going to be receiving. But then sometimes God will make you a jug. God will fill you up. Yes. But then you're going to be poured out into the lives of other people. You're going to be poured out. And some people say to me, say, Pastor, I just want to be used of God. But the moment that they start being used by somebody else, oh, Pastor, they're just using me. Well, isn't that what you prayed about? Because sometimes we'll, God will pour, fill you up. He'll put a handle on you so people can handle you. So people can, uh, can pour you out. And you can be a blessing to other people. Sometimes there's going to be people that are going to grab your handle. You might not like it. But I want to tell you, yes, you can be a bowl. But sometimes God's going to call you to be poured out. You can make a lot of vessels out of clay. God has a plan for your life. It's the work of the unseen will. We see the tabletop. But everything that happens on the top, in the forming of the bowl and the jug and the flower pot, it is all motivated and controlled. By the unseen will. God doesn't take our advice. No. You, can you imagine the clay saying, hey, I don't want to be that. God, God says, hey, I don't take your advice. Our responsibility is not to give God advice. Our responsibility is to simply yield to the will of God and say, God, whatever you want to make me, wherever you want to send me, whatever you want me to do, I know you created me for this purpose. God, I'm not going to be rebellious, but I am going to submit in your hands. I'm going to submit and I'm going to yield to the will of God. God doesn't ask for your advice. He says, I will give grace to the humble. He doesn't ask for our advice. Our responsibility is to simply yield to the will of God. Jeremiah 29 verse 11 says, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. God has a purpose. He doesn't have thoughts of evil. God has got a plan and purpose for your life. And when you find that plan and purpose, and when you begin to operate in that plan and purpose, it's like a hand in a glove. You see, you know what? It just feels like I was made to do this. I'm hastening now, but I want to talk about Joseph. Joseph's life was in the hand of the potter. Yes, and just like Jeremiah, Joseph's life was being molded by the hands of the potter. Joseph's life was being molded and motivated and controlled by the work of the unseen wheel. Genesis 37 tells us that Jacob loved Joseph because he was the son of his old age. And, and Joseph got that nice coat, the coat of many colors. His brothers became jealous. I mean, he started telling them dreams about, hey, boys, one day you guys are going to bow down to me. You're going to worship me and all of this. And I'm going to be the head honcho. You guys, and this is the little brother telling the big brothers, 
I got, I got three boys. I know the little brother doesn't tell the big brothers anything. And Joseph is telling them that, that he's going to be the head honcho. They're going to bow down to him. And they become jealous and they hate him. And he starts, he's having all these dreams. And he tells his brothers, when he tells them the dreams, things go from bad to worse. Not only was he the, the preferred one, the spoiled one, but now he starts to tell them how, how they're going to bow down and thing go, things go from bad to worse. And they take that coat, the coat of many colors, they strip it off him and they cast him into a pit. There was no water in that pit, the Bible tells us. Why, why is that important? Because they left him to die. They took the coat and they dipped it in goat's blood. Verse 32 of Genesis 37 says, And they sent the coat of many colors, and they brought it to the father, Jacob. They brought that coat of many colors to the the, the father that loved the son so much and said, This have we found. Look what we found. We don't know. Is it Joseph's coat or not? We don't know. We just found this coat covered in blood. Jacob knew it and said, Oh, it's my son's coat. He's looking at the things on the surface. He says, it's my son's coat. And then he begins to make some conclusions based on what he can see on the surface. He says, an evil beast has devoured my son. Joseph is without doubt rent in pieces. Jacob has perfect faith in a lie. He's looking at the surface and he has perfect faith. Faith. What do you mean, pastor? Perfect faith. If I was going to define perfect faith, I would use this scripture because it says, Joseph is without doubt. That would have to be the definition of perfect faith, to be without doubt. And now Jacob has perfect faith in a lie. And so Jacob rents his clothes. He puts on sackcloth upon his loins and he mourns. He begins to cry for his son. Dad, we found this coat. We just wanted to bring this to your attention. We just want to let you know about this particular situation. We want to let you look at it, Dad. You just look at it and and you'll know what has happened. Just look at the things on the surface. What does it look like on the surface? We don't know. And so they built a story through an appearance. They built a story through what could be seen with the eye. But I want to remind you, we don't just look at the surface things. Because on the surface, to Jacob, Joseph was dead. On the surface, all Jacob could think of was the grief of losing his son. Accepting the apparent as the inevitable. Accepting the surface things as the inevitable. Church, we must be prepared to deal with the spirit of defeat. Uh, deceit. You see, the, the devil will get you to look at things on the surface. The devil will get you to look at circumstances. Right now, uh, at the beginning of March, when they started to announce the close down of the church services, I begin to lose sleep. Why? Because I was looking at things on the surface. But now I've come to realize that God was at work on the unseen wheel. And now we are seeing the gospel preached to more people than it's ever been preached the gospel is going further the gospel is going longer it's going stronger than it ever has because what the devil meant for evil God is using it for good and there I was I was accepting the apparent as the inevitable. I was looking at the situation that the churches are closed but God was at work on an unseen wheel you see when we get our eyes off Jesus we can begin to be deceived in thinking what we see is all we can see. If I could scream out to Jacob at that moment, Dad, Jacob, stop, think twice. Don't make your conclusions based on what you can see. You don't have to accept what appears as the ultimate verdict. You don't have to accept that, Jacob, we walk by faith and not by sight. Let me tell you, you may not be able to see it, young people, but I want to tell you, God is in control. It's the work of the unseen wheel. Don't allow the devil to come and deceive you and to get your eyes fixed on the visible and the physical because everything in the visible and the physical is preceded by something that is happening in the spiritual and the invisible. Trust God. It's the work of the unseen wheel. And so for 21 long years, Jacob lived with the thought that his son was dead. Why? Because he was living by what he could see and not by faith. The unseen wheel was at work. The Bible says, trust in the Lord with all your heart.
and lean not on your own understanding. My faith, my faith, my faith tonight, and I pray your faith, my faith is in the work of the unseen will. I, my faith is in the fact that God is in control. My faith is in the fact that when I can't track Him, I can trust Him. When I can't see His hand or feel His hand, I can trust His heart. I've come to remind some young person today, when Satan drops that bloody coat in your lap, when he comes to you with a bloody coat, uh, you can trust with your eyes what you can see. Or you can say, God, it doesn't look good on the surface, but I'm going to trust you anyway. I'm going to cling to the unseen hand. I'm going to trust the work of the unseen will. And so Joseph's life was in the potter's hands. First, he was a bowl. He was getting dreams. He was being blessed. And then he was being poured out. And he was, he was interpreting other people's dreams. He was being used by other people. God was forming him. God fills him up. Yes, and Potiphar pours him out. Then the temptation comes in Genesis 39, verse 7. And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife, there, here comes the temptation. He's in the potter's hand. God is molding and making Joseph, but now comes the temptation. And some of you are facing the temptation right now to get yourself out of the potter's hand. The temptation comes. His master's wife has eyes for Joseph. And she said, hey, Joe. She would have smiled real big. She would have had a little twinkle in her eye. Why don't you come lie with me? He didn't listen to her. You see, he didn't listen to the temptation. I'm not leaving the potter's hand for some momentary satisfaction. I'm not leaving the potter's hand to give in to temptation. It didn't matter what Potiphar's wife did to him. It didn't matter what Joseph's brother did to him. He stayed in the potter's hand. And God made a, a, a wonderful example of Joseph's life. What seemed to be trouble, what seemed as terrible on the surface, God worked it for good. It was the work. Of the unseen will. Yes, he was a bowl. Get, 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 get. He was a pitcher or a jug and he was being poured out. But now Joseph, and I wish I had one, now he's a, a flower pot. What's happening now is that he's been designed to accommodate growth. Out of a, out of a plant springs forth a flower. And there, that flower, those vegetables feed the whole world. Joseph is now there, positioned just as the will of God had it. To be able to feed his family and his nation in a time of famine. Thank God Joseph didn't step out of the potter's hands. Thank God he didn't give in to temptation. Because his time came and the dreams were fulfilled. He begins, he ends up being a governor. He's the one who sold the food to those who came. And all the dreams come to pass. I want to tell you, some of you, God has given a vision. God has given you dreams. Stay in the potter's hand. Trust the work of the unseen wheel. It was a Wednesday night in 2001. The reason why Wednesday nights in 2001 were interesting is because I wasn't home very often during the week. At that time, I was working for a, a a multinational, multinational global company called Deloitte's traveling all week, commuting to Melbourne and various other parts of the world in Australia. But this Wednesday night I was home and it was funny because it was around that time that our church got a big screen. Once upon a time, big screens were new and they, they were amazing. And I remember Brother Slack, sometimes on a midweek, he would show a video and, and my dad would show a video from Because of the Times or something like that to encourage the church. But this Wednesday night, Bishop Downs, my dad, was showing a message by Brother Anthony Mangan called, The Bottom Line is Evangelizing a Lost World. In the message, he said, The bottom line is, I don't exist for any other reason than to evangelize a lost and dying world. And he said these words, and they got me right in the heart. They said, It's time to get serious about the business of the church. Yes, it was awkward. It was a midweek service. You don't often have altar calls at midweek. But it's even awkward when it's a video. But I just felt God moving on my heart like He has never moved before. I came and I kneeled right there at that altar, right there. I'm pointing to the spot right there. I went to the altar. I went there and I prayed. And I prayed until they had closed in prayer. And I stayed and I prayed and prayed. And that night I said, God, 
Let me tell you, I wasn't a sinner. I wasn't doing anything bad. I was just doing things my own way. Following a career, taking promotions, buying, buying houses, trying to keep up with the Joneses. But that day at that altar, I said, Lord, I give my life completely to you. I am the clay. I prayed these words. I am the clay. You are the potter. And these are the other words I pray. Lord, if you open the door, I will walk through it. I've come to learn, young people, that God has a plan and a purpose for our life. It's not our job to give God advice. It's our, God, it's our job to yield and submit to the potter's hand. You see, we all want the map to be unfolded so we can see where it's going. But God reveals the map one page at a time. You've just got to trust Him one step at a time, one day at a time. Learning to trust God. Let me tell you, when you learn to trust God, you will turn your fears into faith. You will dispel all limitations. You can do whatever God has called you to do when you can turn your fears into faith. Somebody says, well, pastor, right now, what if I don't even feel God? How can I trust a God that I can't feel? I feel empty. You see, I, I also have those feelings at times. I know God is there just like Joseph. If you read the story of Joseph, the Bible continually says, and the Lord was with Joseph. You see, sometimes God may be silent, but He's never absent. And I think that the low times, when we have those low times, Sometimes we don't want to have those times, but the low times when you don't feel God, it's those low times that give us the ability to appreciate the times when we can feel God. Yes, there are low times, but those low times are not times to run from. They're times to walk through. But David said, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. We tend to run from the low times, but sometimes God wants you to walk through the time, those low times. Why? Because there is a relationship with God that you can only have in the valley. I feel empty, Pastor. I was thinking about emptiness because I was about to preach a message on Easter about the empty tomb and the empty promises of Easter. You see, the greatest proof of the power of God the greatest proof of the power of God is when Jesus wasn't there. I preached this one day. The greatest power of God, the greatest demonstration of the power of God was when Jesus wasn't there. They went to the tomb. He wasn't there. He's missing. The tomb is empty. There's a whole lot of things missing in the Easter story. The men were missing. Where were they? They were meant to be with the women. They got there. The stone was missing. They went inside the tomb and Jesus was missing. And the greatest proof of the power of God in the whole Bible, I believed, is when there was something missing. When it wasn't there, they said, He is not here. He is risen. And that is the promise that we cling to today, that our God is alive. And the greatest power of God is demonstrated when Jesus wasn't there. Let me tell you, there's some valleys that we're going to have to walk through. There's some low times that we're going to have to walk through. But it's through those valleys where you can grow closer to God than you've ever grown before. I've come to remind you, trust the work of the unseen Remind somebody tonight that God is in control. Young people, that situation that's playing out in your life, the broken family, I tell you, God is in control. God can use that brokenness. God can make a wonderful message out of your mess. God can take your test and give you a testimony. God can raise you up to be a mighty woman and a mighty man of God. I know I've, I've read the history books. I've seen story after story that the people that God uses the most are the ones that have been broken the most. In fact, I would go as far to say that God cannot use anybody who hasn't been broken. Yes, marred in the potter's hand. But marred and broken and bruised in the safest place that you could be. Stay in the potter's hand. 
trust the work of the unseen wheel. Yes, the potter was working a work on the wheels, the surface, but then under the table, the unseen wheel. Everything that happens on the surface is being motivated and controlled by the work of the unseen wheel. Put your trust in God. He'll never fail. I'm going to pray right now. Why don't you just close your eyes wherever you are. God is speaking specifically to a young person right now. The circumstances on top, you don't know what is happening. I've come to tell you to trust God. Lord Jesus, we thank you. Lord, you said you would never leave us or forsake us. Lord, for you are our refuge and strength, oh God. And right now I can feel your presence. And Lord God, I pray that your presence would fill the rooms and the homes of those that are watching tonight. Lord, help us not to lose hope. Lord, help us not to fixate our attention on the things that are happening on the surface. But help us to trust the work of the unseen wheel. God, I'll trust you. One more time, God, I'll trust you. Even if I'm mad, even if I'm broken, oh God, even if I'm bruised, I want to stay in the safest place where I can be. In the hands of the potter. If this message has touched your life tonight, if this message has touched your heart, and you need to talk to somebody, why don't you call your youth pastor tonight? Why don't you call your youth leader and say, Pastor, God has spoken to me. Tell them, put a comment down on on, on the bottom of the comments and say, God is speaking to me. I just got to trust Him. Whoever you are, call your pastor, ask for help. But whatever you do, don't leave the potter's hand. Put your trust in the work of the unseen wheel. Young people, we are a privileged people to be living in these last days. Don't give up. Don't walk away. God could have called Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John to be matched with these last days. But He's called us. That tells me while I've got faith in God, God has a tremendous faith in me. He's going to use you and I for the furtherance of His kingdom. Stay in His hands and trust the work of the unseen wheel. Love you, young people. Stay strong in Jesus' name.